Hello. I'm Leonard Edwards, a retired judge from the state of California, where for 26 years I worked in the Superior Court, primarily in juvenile and family court. Now I'm a consultant to the courts of California. They call me a judge in residence, but I also consult with courts across the country. And today I'd like to talk about achieving timely permanency. And what I mean by that is I'm talking about children in foster care and the efforts by the court to have them placed in permanent placements in a timely fashion. A permanent placement is in their own home, an adoptive placement, a guardianship, or with a relative. A permanent placement is not foster care. It's not group home care or private institutional care. Timely means within a year as soon as possible would be best, but the law sets out one year as the time frame in which permanency should be achieved. Why do we have timely permanency as a goal? What's the reason for that? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, it's the law. Both federal and state laws tell us, as judges, that we should reach permanency for children in a timely fashion. And one year is that time frame in which we work. But there's more than just the law. There are also judicial ethics, ethics which instruct us to get our work done in a timely fashion. In no other area of the law is it truer that Justice delayed is justice denied. Thirdly, children need timely permanency. They are developing beings. They don't have the same sense of time that we do. Children can't wait. And we in the judicial branch need to acknowledge that child's sense of time. We need to move quickly. We need to treat these cases as they were an emergency. Fourthly, it's our duty as a judge to manage our cases. We are, the, we are the professionals, we're the leaders who set the pace of litigation. Not the social worker, not the lawyers, but we, the courts, need to control the pace of litigation. Also, if we don't do it, in addition to all of the reasons I've given, our state, the states that we work in, can lose money because our states are being audited by the federal government to see if we are, among other things, achieving timely permanency. And this can result in millions of dollars of losses to our state. And we in the courts have a, have a role in that. It's not the social service agency that determines whether a case is going to be continued, whether timely permanency is achieved in the courts. The courts are a part of that issue. They're part of the problem. Because one of the reasons I'm talking to you today about timely permanency is that we're not doing a very good job in our courts. And I've been across this country. I've read the statistics. I've written on this. We are not achieving timely permanency, except in a few cases. Well, how do we do it? How can we achieve timely permanency? Well, we start with the court. It involves judicial leadership. Judges need to take control of the calendars, of the dockets, of the cases that come before them. Well, how can judges do that? Well, there are some best practices. And the first best practice is the way we structure our courts. One judge, one family. That's the best practice. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when a child comes before the court, that child and that family should see the same judge. And that judge should see the same family from the initial shelter care hearing through the final hearing, whether that be placement back with the family, whether that be an adoption, a guardianship, or placement with a relative. So that one judge then has a responsibility to control and monitor that case to see that that case moves along in a timely fashion. Well, how can, the, how can the judge do that? 
Well, there are some danger signs that we all are aware of. We in the court system understand the evil of continuances. Continuances are easy to get in the court system. We're a deliberate system. We want everybody to be ready. And yet, as I said earlier, this is an emergency. This is a situation where we have to move quickly for a number of reasons. The child can't wait, but the parents need to be involved in their case plan early also. So we need to have early hearings and meaningful hearings. I call it front-loading. We need to start these cases off as quickly and as effectively as we can. And how can we measure that? Well, at the first hearing, are the attorneys already appointed? Have they met with their client? Have they reviewed the case materials? Are they ready to have a meaningful hearing in which they can talk about issues? Has the father been identified? Have Indian Child Welfare Act issues been addressed? These are all issues that need to be discussed early in the case, because if they're not, they can arise later in the case and send us back to square one. In addition, timely permanency can be achieved if we resolve the adjudicatory issues as early as possible. Now, every state has a different standard. Some states do it in less than 15 days, Texas and Pennsylvania, California. Some states set it at 60 days, the majority of states. Some states do it in 120 days. That is to say, the state statute orders the judge to complete the adjudication within 120, 60, 30 days, whatever. The federal government says that the clock starts running at 60 days. That's the date that a child enters foster care if adjudication has not taken place earlier. My position is that we ought to do it as early as possible. A number of states have proven you can do it in less than 30 days. And so whether your statute says 30, 60, or 120, let's see if we can get the adjudication resolved earlier. Why is that important? Until the adjudication is resolved, the parents may well be in a litigation mood. They may be preparing for trial. They may think that this is all a mistake. And parents need to be involved in their service plan as soon as possible, or the case should be dismissed as soon as possible if the evidence isn't there. You say, well, we've been doing this at 60 or 80 or 90 days for so many years, we can't make those changes. Well, I'm, I'm glad to tell you that even though cult, court cultures are difficult to change, they can be changed. And a number of courts have proven that around the country. And so how do we do it? One judge, one family, early and meaningful hearings, adjudication taking place early in the case, the parents getting involved in their service plan as early as possible so that they can address the, address the significant problems that have brought their child and them before the juvenile court and then reviews. Judges need to monitor these cases so they're sure that what they have ordered in court is in fact taking place in the field. So come back in 30 or 60 days and find out if the service plan is in place, if parents are visiting their child, if the parents are involved in their case plan, if the child is doing well and been placed in the appropriate concurrent home, and is the social worker doing her job? Has she started doing the work that the court has ordered? These interim hearings hold everyone accountable. If everyone's doing his or her job, they are extremely short. But if they're not doing the job, it's better to catch that at 60 days than at the six-month hearing. And that's why it's the judge who needs to uh, preside over that hearing and bring the parties back. Finally, if we're going to improve our court system, we need to collaborate. Now, what am I talking about? Well, court improvement can't be done by the judge alone. The judge is the key person, the leader, the one who sets the structure of the court, 
who monitors the cases. But there are a number of administrative issues that involve the attorneys, they involve the agency, service providers, perhaps the clerks of the court. So judges should have meetings convened by the court in which agency representatives, attorney representatives, and other significant persons, CASAs, child advocates, GALs, meet on a regular basis to talk about improving court practice. Everyone has a stake in that. The judge is the convener and perhaps sets an, an agenda which others can add to. But these regular meetings are a best practice in model courts across the country. And they are very consistent with judicial ethics because you're not talking about individual cases, you're talking about court operations, you're talking about the administration of justice, and you're talking about how to improve it. So collaboration is a key part of court improvement. Well, I've, I've said a lot about achieving permanency, and it's not an easy goal. It's not something that can be done overnight. But with judicial leadership, with collaboration, and using some of the techniques that I have outlined, courts around the country have demonstrated that they can reduce the time it takes for children to reach timely permanency. I urge you all to consider making these changes so that we can fulfill our legal duty as well as our ethical duties towards the abused and neglected children who appear in our courts.